Welcome back to uh, a uh, new series called The Exposed in the Myth with uh, our brother Mel and joining me here in studio also for his, uh, uh, you know, interaction uh, with this, uh, you know, new discoveries or at least new research information that brother Mel is sharing with us about a number of Islamic myth and he is giving us uh, possible origins for where many of those uh, may have uh, come from or at least a tie uh, to uh, the Zoroastrian religion that could have been responsible to reshape what we call early Islamic practices. Today we're going to talk about a mythical story known as Al-Isra or Mi'raj, where uh, a mention of a mythical animal known as Al-Buraq, who took Muhammad from Mecca to Jerusalem or to the far mosque, Al-Aqsa Mosque, where he prayed and then this uh, this mythical also uh, animal took him all the way to heaven al miraj basically so we are going to ask brother mel now to give us an idea about the origin of this myth and the name mel welcome back again thank you so much for uh, this wonderful and fascinating research indeed well it's great to be back i think the key thing here with the burak is the origin of the word burak so that's going to be a large part of what we're going to find out today and also what's going to be interesting is that it suggests that at least in Persian lands, Muhammad was viewed not as a prophet, but as a shaman, which is someone who conjures evil forces, you know, um, uh, which is not really the sort of Muhammad that traditionally he's viewed as. So it's, there's lots of hidden meanings in, in, in relation to the story of the Burak, as we'll see later. OK, so um, the hagiography of Islam assures us that the Prophet Muhammad ascended to heaven from Jerusalem on the mythical beast, Bur the Burak. He crossed the seven spheres, exchanged greetings with the patriarchs and beheld the glory of God. The Dinyark, Dinkart tells us that at the entreaties of Asho Zarathustra, transcendently elevated his consciousness to the realm of heaven, wherein he looked at the majesty of God. A similar journey was attributed to the virtuous Arda Viraf, who visited hell, purgatory, and heaven during his spiritual journey. So the Dinkart is the Acts of Religion. It's a 10th century compendium of Zoroastrian beliefs and customs during the, the time. Now, it gets a little bit more interesting when we look at the, the origin of the word Burak itself. So um, the suggestion is that it's either Sogdian, which is sort of in the greater Iran, or Patlavi, um, and it is likely the the likely candidate is Barak. That's the where it comes from. Now, what is meant by a, a Barak? Um, it is a riding animal. Um, it can variations of it can refer to a rider as well. Okay, and and also has the meaning of horse and, and mount and so forth. Okay, so in addition to that, um, we have the following. Um, the most likely origin for a Turkic word of cultural significance is in Iranian. Um, in fact, we find that the Avastan bar to ride old Persian Asa bara rider horseman. So it's clear that that's where it comes from. So they've picked up the, the words, at least for this story, and, and perhaps also the story itself, as we'll see. So the Barak may represent the devil Ah, Greenman. This is another demonic link, believe it or not. Um, so it should first be noted that Barak is Middle Persian, signifies no ordinary horse. Rather, it is the sobriquet for a fantastic mount, either the devil Afriman, whom one of the mythical Persian kings, Ta Morap, pursued and rode upon as his charger for 30 years, or else the fiery horse of the apocalypse which will be seen by night and in the atmosphere conceived by the spiritual gods. So this is quite strange, really, for uh, the Islamic religion to have Muhammad uh, traveling to heaven on essentially what could be a demon called Afriman. So it seems like they've taken the word from um, the Persian and Zoroastrian culture. And with that, the concept of, um, you know, essentially a, a flying horse. OK, um, now it also has connections in the Turkey culture to um, shamans. Um, so in later centuries, it took on meanings like um, 
hairy dog and and so on because of its link with um, and also first man which is um, a shamanic animal um, so it's kind of a strange one now um, what about this um, demon afri man his main goal according to zoroastrian mythology is to fill the world with as much evil as he can so it will destroy itself so this is what islam proposes as the the burak that muhammad is on so while it could be argued that muhammad riding on the demon afriman suggests subduing this demon it is still a very strange association depictions of zoroaster typically portray him in white vestments which are also worn by present-day zoroastrian priests it is not clear if islam copies the wearing of white when on hajj from zoroastrianism so that's that could be a link there. So I'm leaving that kind of 50-50 on that one. Zoroaster, Zoroaster appears with a raised hand and thoughtfully lifted finger as if to make a point. Um, you'll probably recognize Al Ali Dawa there. I'm just playfully uh, noticing the similarity in pose there. Uh, um, and he, uh, I mean, in, in, in all fairness, he likes grapes. So there is a connection between grapes and Zoroaster and himself. <laughs> That is true. Um, so in Zoroastrianism, water and fire are agents of ritual purity, and the associated purification ceremonies are considered the basis of ritual life. In Zoroastrian cosmogony, water and fire are respectively the second and last primordial elements to have been created, and scripture considers fire to have its origin in the waters. Both water and fire are represented within the precinct of a fire temple. Now, the Zamzam's well name strongly suggests, as we saw in the last um, episode, that it is named after the Zoroastrian demon Zam. Zoroastrian rituals, according to Al Tabari, were called Li Al Zamzama. Zoroastrians usually pray in the presence of some form of fire, and the culminating rite of the principal act of worship constitutes a strengthening of the waters. Fire is considered a me medium through which spiritual insight and wisdom are gained, and water is considered the source of that wisdom. But fire and water are also hypothesized as the Yazatas, Atar, and Anahita, with worship hymns and litanies dedicated to them. So th these are two more Zoroastrian gods associated with fire and water. Um, now, it's interesting that um, uh, the Chinese source refers to the Abbasids as Heiyi Dashi, which literally means black Tayaye. So it's still a question mark as to why they were called the black Tayaye. The obvious explanation would be they're wearing black. Does the, the color black have any significance? Um, let's come back to that in a second. But here are the, these two gods at Atar and Anahita, which are from a Christian point of view are essentially demons. So the fire god Adur or Atar, is on a coin of the Turk a Shahi king, uh, Tigan Shah, 728 CE. The ultimate etymology of Atar, previously unknown, is now believed to be from the Indo-European uh, word fire, a uh, word for fire. This would make it related to Latin Atar, which means black. And it's interesting that the, the Abbasids are referred to the black dashi. Could that be a link with Atar? However, um, it's unclear, but the Persian house of Karan dressed in green to symbolize the Mithraic god Mir. So maybe there is something in, in terms of the, the significance of the black that the Abbasids um, wore. Um, now, in terms of Anahita, it's the name of an Iranian water goddess, i.e. demon whose symbol is the lotus flower. If you look at the center of it, it reminds me very much of the, the black stone in the, in, in the Kaaba. Um, it was prior to the fourth century BC, conflated with Istar and with Venus or Aphrodite, also referred to as Ard Weiser, the lady of the waters in Zoroastrian text post 651. Um, so it's also called Ishtar, which is found in Iraq. Now, it's interesting here, this is a coin from uh, the Umayyad Caliphate uh, under Yassi I, uh, 680 to 683. You'll notice to the right, the fire altar with attendants and the crescent and star flanking the flames. 
why were the Umayyad leaders so comfortable with having images of a polytheist religion on official coins? I don't know if either of you want to come in on this one. Yeah, Jay, that, that's uh, you know, yeah, your this department. Is, yeah. This is fascinating as you're bringing up not only the political symbol of the fire, I'm sorry, of the star in the crescent, which can be traced all the way back to the second century BC. Khosrau the first actually has that symbol on his coins. This is not, this is fa this is what later the Ottomans then take as the symbol for Islam itself. But if you're in in Persian area and these coins were all minted in what is today Iran and Iraq, we did this when we look at the coins. There is a picture of Khosrau on the left. There is the fire altar, suggesting therefore that these are incorporating these practices, which would then echo exactly what you're saying here. They had no problem doing this because they wanted to not only they were familiar with it, uh, but also they wanted to please the people that were there in that area. Wonderful. Yeah. All right, brother. So, we have about a minute or so. If you want okay. to continue now. So Zoroastrian priests are often depicted with veils since face veils were used to avoid contaminating the holy fire with breath or saliva at a fire temple. This is an 8th century Tang dynasty clay figure of a Sogdian man, possibly a Zoroastrian priest. And you'll remember that there are images of Muhammad in a very similar way. This is a 16th century Ottoman illustration depicting Muhammad at the Kaaba. Muhammad's face is veiled and appears with fire which are both signs of a possible Zoroastrian influence. The practice of veiling Muhammad was followed in the Islamic art since the 16th century. Now, it could be that this has um, entered the tradition via Sufism, which might have been influenced by Zoroastrianism. It may not have come in directly, but there does seem to be some form of link there. And if we just tie it all together then, so we have the water principle, Anahita or Aphrodite, connected with the Zamzam well. Um, we have the fire principle, potentially, Attar, which means black. The Kaaba is decked in black. So perhaps that was considered a fire temple from the Zoroastrian point of view originally. And they're linked via the black stone, which represents Aphrodite, according to St. John of Damascus. So I think there might be something to this. Um, and so it's it could be that this site was used both by Muslims and by Zoroastrians in the early days, and both brought their own symbolism and meaning to the site. Um, but it does look like in early Islam, there was a, um, a lot of um, willingness to imbibe Zoroastrian ideas, which is a real contradiction of the idea of Islam being a monotheistic religion. So in summary, uh, Zoroastrianism massively influenced how Islam developed its prayer rituals and washing, its myths, its sunna, even the well in Mecca is called a synonym for Zoroastrianism, i.e. Zamzam. So we'll come back to you in the studio. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And I want us to really get ready for the next one. I think we will be talking about, if I recall, about uh, the uh, origin of the Aisha and Fatima uh, story, or at least maybe names, and how they are linked to Ishmael. Anything else, uh, Jay, you want to add? No, I'm, this is all fascinating because we have been so, we know that when a, you have a book and a man in a place, you then need to have a backstory. You need to have a theology that supports it. They're looking right, left, and center. They're not, they didn't have to look very far. Their headquarters is in Baghdad. Uh, Kufa is where their theological center is. Who is all around them? The Zoroastrians all around them. Mel's hit on something here. It looks like they did a lot of borrowing. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Mel. Thank you, Jay. Thank you, everyone. This is Al-Fadi over and out. God bless. Take care. Thank you for watching this video. Be sure to like and subscribe to our channel, Sierra International, and click on the bell so that you receive notifications whenever we publish a new video or go live. I would also like to appeal to you to consider becoming a Patreon patron by clicking the link right below. By doing so, you can give towards the production of these videos. There are also other options for you where you can give to our channel. I thank you from the bottom of my heart.